welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Garth Newfeld, along with Eric Landrum, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the in stuff. So today I'm thinking to myself, what is better than one Eric? And if you said two Eric's, you are correct. This is episode number 84, where Eric had the opportunity to interview Eric from Boise State University. If you were at all confused by that, Eric Landrum has the opportunity to interview Eric Martin from Boise State University in Boise, Idaho. But before we get to that, let me tell you about an exciting new feature that we have rolled out Ask Psych Sessions. The first episode was released last Tuesday, episode number one, featuring Jane Hallinan. And uh, these are bite-sized interviews where you send in questions and we find experts to answer them. Uh, The first question was sent in by yours truly, uh, but we do have a list of questions. And if you want to add your name and question to the list, we will give credit to you on air and you can do that at bit.ly backslash ask psych sessions. That's B-I-T dot L-Y backslash ask psych sessions. That is all lowercase, no spaces. And one more thing. If you could pause the episode right now and go to iTunes, we invite you to rate us on iTunes. It helps us pop when people are searching for psychology-related podcasts or teaching-related podcasts. Now... Before you hear this interview with Eric Martin, please allow me to share some listening tips and some of my favorite moments. So I have this theory that people who listen to a lot of podcasts, uh, they kind of get how good podcasts go, and Eric Martin listens to a lot of podcasts. Uh, In fact, Eric listens at twice the speed, and um, well, somewhere around twice the speed, and the Eric's get into a conversation about if you can meaningfully understand podcasts at twice the speed. Now, I should mention here that uh, Psych Sessions has uh, now brought on our third co-host, Marianne Lloyd from Seton Hall University, and she is going to be uh, taking care of our Ask Psych Sessions features. I mention this because she tells me that she listens to podcasts at an accelerated rate as well. She's also very good on podcasts. So who knows? Um... I can tell that Eric and Eric are uh, very chummy, that there is a lot of mutual respect, that they have a a friendship and a relationship that goes beyond this conversation, and that really comes through in this. Um, I think the Erics would both agree that there is some mentoring that has taken place uh, formally and informally between the two of them. Now, what's interesting about Eric Martin is that he is not a psychologist, And that becomes a very long conversation that I want to revisit with Eric. I actually just want to have a conversation about this because in the state of Idaho, you cannot be a psychologist unless you are a clinical psychologist. So you'll have to wait to hear what kind of psychology Eric Martin uh, has a background in uh, because there is just a whole lot going on, it sounds like, at Boise State with regards to uh, what Eric Martin does and what Eric Landrum does. And I hope that I have teased you enough that you're going to go and listen to this. Now, one of the things that comes through Eric Martin's research is that he really values the the benefit of what he has to offer, not only to academia or to scholarship, but the applied side of that to benefit the lives of others and to benefit the community. And I thought this was just outstanding, impressive. I was thinking about the citizen psychologist uh, criteria through the American Psychological Association, and I thought to myself, well, Eric Martin might check those boxes, uh, and if not now, at least in the future, on this trajectory. It sounds like he is giving away all the benefits of psychology in really important ways to the people around him and making the world a better place through it. 
Eric and Eric have an interesting conversation about uh, camaraderie in, in the workplace. He is an early career psychologist, and this is his first job outside uh, or post-PhD. And he discusses the social development of that transition. So moving from undergraduate to graduate programs to um, and having these tight-knit groups of people moving into a department where you expect that maybe this is what academia would be like, is that people would show up when you invite them places, and you're all in this together, um, just like you have been up until this point. Um, and what he uh, they have a conversation about is that it's not always that way at the workplace. And he had to transition a little bit, um, not only to a new city, but to a new group of colleagues. And this group of colleagues was different than maybe being in graduate school. And the camaraderie was different. And so they have an important conversation about how do you get used to that when you are moving uh, from like student life into professional life, when you're moving um, locations into um, just a new season and a new environment. I found that that was uh, something that I could not only identify with, but uh, probably pretty helpful to you ECPs out there where it might feel a little bit different, maybe even a little bit lonely or um, a little bit isolating. So uh, good thing that Eric and Eric found each other. It sounds like that um, relationship has been beneficial to the both of them. You are really going to enjoy this interview with Eric Martin from Boise State University. So here we go. Let's listen in. I am here with a dear friend of mine, Dr. Eric Martin, from the Department of Kinesiology at Boise State University. Welcome, Eric. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to be here. I am excited to have you here. We're sitting here in my luxurious office. Of penthouse, the, uh, I think is what they call it. Uh, penthouse. The corner penthouse, <laughs> uh, the sixth floor of the education building here at Boise State. And uh, you're the first person I've ever interviewed who came into the interview with a golf ball. So, uh, you know, so let's, let's start there. Shall I, I'm we? proud I have that honor then, I guess I, that, you know, it's always nice to be the first. So, so can you talk a little bit about, uh, and you can tell from the copious notes that I have an outline of where we're going to go today. And I actually do know that you're a listener. So you kind of, you kind of actually do know where we're going to go. It's I a think. little different though. Usually I listen at two times speed. So you're talking much slower than what I usually okay, listen okay, to. Wait, so. wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. You listen at two times speed because we're twice boring. What is that mean? That way I can listen to it twice in the same amount of time, Eric. Maybe. Wait. <laughs> so you can, it, so I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. And so the only way I can get through my long, long list is by listening fast. And is it still, I, I, I dare ask this, is it still intelligible? It is to me. So my wife thinks it sounds like gibberish. And I sometimes show it to students as an example, and they, they can't, decipher anything, but I have an ear for these things. I've, I've grown up to it. So initially I was at the one and a half speed. Now I'm more at like a 2.1, 2.2 speed. Oh my gosh. So you, so are there any that you listen to that oh, I can't do two X, I got to do 1.8? There's a few and usually it's more audio quality than it is anything else. If it's mm -hmm. in and out, then I have to slow down a little bit. Or if it's uh sometimes if it's uh someone whose English is a second language, it's sometimes harder to pick up some of those things. But most most of the time, it's it's that two speed. Yeah. So, what could we do during this podcast that would make you slow down and listen? Is there anything we could talk? About? Is there a topic? Topically, is there something that if you heard us talking about, you're going to go, "Wait, I'm not doing two x. I'm going to slow this puppy down, and I want to listen to this at one point four." Whew, uh, that's a tough question. I don't know any topics that are there, but anything that I think is is very, very thought provoking, and and this may not set up well because oh, I, you that's... just said I was a listener, right? Uh, uh. Right. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm pretty good. Like I said, my wife talks fast, and so I've just learned to uh, learn to process. I know there are scientific studies, right? So I, I'm an academic. I've I've read some of those that say anything over 1.3 times you're not comprehending and learning or taking that through. So I, I have read those studies, um, but I still do it. We, we all do things we've read about and not do, right? Well, and plus you're not being tested on the content of your podcast True. listening. And it's not life or death if you don't retain 
uh, this American life or whatever you're listening true, to. True. It's not, it's not, gonna... and, and a lot of it is pop culture or sports. And so I, I follow that enough that I, I pick up the main things. And so it's more augmentation of what I already know. So, okay. Wow. 2X, 2.1, 2X? Sometimes 2, 1, 2, 2, depending on which podcast it is. The ones that I've listened to for a really long time, I can speed it up depending on if there's multiple people on it or not. So now, now, I, I'm going to ask you this. I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to <laughs> anyway. Um, do you speed it up more for me or for Garth? It's about the same for both of you, actually. Okay, so. all right. I was yeah. hoping But this is slower. nice. I, I'm able to enjoy your, your soothing tones even more in this uh, one-time speed since okay. we're live now. So, ladies and gentlemen, here's what that is. That is a 10-year track faculty <laughs> member at Boise State. Although we're not even in the same pre tenure too, so just yeah. in case you're my external reviewer, I, I just need that uh, need that put in there. I don't, but external reviewer wouldn't be in this, no, in this within no. the same university. It wouldn't be. So there's no way I can impact your promotion and tenure. That just shows that we're good friends, Eric. Right uh, there. Ex- except if if you asked me for a letter, I would write one though. Oh, I would well, be happy. I to appreciate do that. that. That that would. Be I, the, I'm sure I will have to bug you for a letter for something down the line, and, and I, I would, will. I would be honored to yeah. do that. Now, I think we should hit record, and, and that, that's a good warm-up. Now, should, should we start now? Let's do it. No, I've been recording for a few <laughs> minutes now. I was going to say, yeah, this is easy. Yeah, so. it, it is easy. <laughs> so um, the the 2X, I'm sorry, it really fascinated me. So I want to come back to the golf ball. So you came All in right. with a golf ball, and you had to put it in your bag. Uh, you So um, tell me, I'm embarrassed to admit this. I don't know a damn thing about kinesiology. You are a <laughs> professor of kinesiology. I am. I am. What the hell is that? Well, so so that's a loaded question, right? So my background... But that I don't know anything about well, it? Well, no, no. That, that, that's a pretty straightforward <laughs> statement. <laughs> well, my background is actually psychology. Thank and you. So, so my undergrad degree is there. And then both of my degrees are sports psychology. So, okay. so I do relate to some of the psych. And so I really bring in kind of a unique perspective, I would say, to the kinesiology department. So... Some of my students will come in and tell me, like, I'm really struggling in biomechanics. Can you help me? And I go, I would love to help you. I've never taken a biomechanics class in my life. So I, I think you should look for another professor what, who might wh- be more more beneficial what for that. What is biomechanics? So biomechanics is really kind of the movement analysis. So if you get injured and your gait starts changing, we would say your biomechanics of that gait is changing, which can lead to injury because it throws off a lot of um, alignment issues and different aspects like that. Is so, that like the $6 million man? Did it, did it, did it, you're that, showing my that, age is that, now. No, my age is what. Well. <laughs> I'm showing. Or is that like when they put the dots on the guy exactly. on the, on like, the treadmill? Uh, yep, exactly, where they're doing gait analysis or some other okay. aspects of that. So right. kinesiology just in general is just the stu- study of human movement. And so okay. it's a pretty large ranking field or large base field where we have physiologists who are lo- really looking at kind of cellular level, what's going on as far as how the body works, what kind of nutrition is important. Um, our department's nice and diverse. So we actually have a sport history person, a motor hmm. development person. We have a couple people who do statistics and research methods. Um, and then I'm the lone sports psychologist expert over in the kinesiology department. So you could really easily fit in a department of psychological science. I could. There's So in sports psychology, there's really these kind of two tracks for sports psych. And so... Um, your undergrad degree is not as critical as far as which track you go through. And then your master's kind of shifts you on one lane or the next. So for mine, I really wanted to do performance enhancement. And so that's where my path went. And so usually those are housed in colleges or departments of kinesiology. So my master's and my PhD are both in the Department of Kinesiology in Sports Psychology, where we're really looking yeah. at research, which is a key component of it, and then really looking at more that kinesis field and looking at performance psychology. Where so, okay, oh, I'm sorry, no, go ahead. the other track would be much more of the clinical aspect. And so these are individuals who do either clinical or counseling psychology, and then they work with athletes, but they're working very much more with the mental health. So working with athletes like I do, um, I am fully focused on how can we augment performance? What are we going to do to really help your confidence, deal with stress, anxiety, help with coping strategies, some of those things that are much more normal functioning. And so if that ever geared towards more of a clinical aspect as far as, you know, moving towards depression or things like suicidal ideation or some cutting behaviors, um, I have 
no qualifications for that. I don't Neither really do want I. to deal with that. And so that's where I would search for a referral, which I have a referral network that I would do that with. So you're an undergrad. You do psych, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Where do you say to yourself, I want to do performance enhancement? My undergrad advisor, who I was really, really lucky to find at Colorado State. So at Colorado State, I was an honor student. And with that, I was able to register for early classes. And so um, I was able to take some classes that I probably wouldn't have been exposed to otherwise. And so I found one class that said sports psychology. And so when I entered into college, I really wanted to be a coach. And so I thought, wow, this sounds awesome. So I took Brian Butkey. He's in the, he was the professor there. I took his class and he said, you know, if you're interested in this, let's do a research project. And so I said, great. So really um, I did a research project over there as an undergrad. I did a couple others where I was supervising some stuff, but that was all in the kinesiology department. That was extra external to my psychology degree. So um, that was just kind of the path I went to. Um, I found that class. I met that advisor and that he kind of directed me in that way. That, that seems fairly random. It is. Absolutely. Yes. That, that, well, it's funny because I know I'm a listener, right? So yeah, I know you, yeah, you, you, you always say it's not chance, but I, I think of it as like random. there are flex points that happen, right? That can completely change the way your life turns out, whether you go path A or path B. And I definitely think finding Brian was one of those big flex points. Um, another one of those is I graduated um, from Colorado State and they kind of talked about, you know, we have a job. I was a work study at the city of Fort Collins youth sports department. They said, we have a job for you if you want. And I said, I appreciate that. I really love Fort Collins, which is where Colorado state is. It's a great place. But I think if I don't do a master's and a PhD, which is what I wanted to do now, I don't think I would be able to give up money when you never had money. It doesn't matter if you give it up. Right. right. And so I decided to do that master's education out at Miami. And so because of that, I feel like that was a big flex point because I could see working at that youth sports division, being really happy there, working with youth, helping coaching education, doing those types of things. But I'm really glad I took this path instead. But that decision has nothing to do with luck. Um, it has to do with meeting Brian, because if I didn't meet Brian, I never would have had that decision to make though. Yeah. But you, you knew that you had to keep momentum going. You That's knew fair. yourself enough to know. And for what it's worth, I knew myself to know that I was so distracted squirrel, uh, <laughs> that if I didn't keep going to school, I, I would stop going to school. And I, and I think that's true. I would say that's more of a flex point than a luck point because I yeah. agree that was a, a conscious decision that I made. And so I think that's true. That wasn't necessarily luck, but I would say finding Brian was that luck in a sea of lots of other things going on. Yeah, and I think as an honor student, you probably had access to a lot of opportunities. If it hadn't been Brian, it might have been another professor true. in another topic that it might not have been kinesiology, but it might have been sociology. And I agree with that, actually, because a lot of the classes that I had, I feel like things like IO psych align really well with sports psych. Yeah. Um, I took a cognitive psych class that was probably my favorite class outside of my sports psych classes. So I could definitely see me moving that direction. Um, but the sports part was something that I just had interest growing up in, something that was there. And so that really helped move that way. So sports was baked in before you got to college. Absolutely. So as but as uh, athlete and participant or as uh, I think I might want to be a sports psychologist as you got to college. Sports psychologist was never really on my radar. It was actually when I went to college initially, I thought I wanted to coach and teach. And so hmm. doing the high school route, which um, I still kind of wish that I coach to some extent. I see the underappreciation of coaches now and the low pay and the long hours. And so sometimes I'm glad I didn't go that route. But I think you've still got time for low pay and long hours. I think I'm already there, right? <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Nicely done. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think... Um, I really wanted to do something in sport. I didn't really know what that was. So initially it was a coach and a, a teacher. Didn't 
took some education courses, didn't really like that. So I was like, well, maybe sports journalism. So I jumped in that and I took a couple journalism classes that I didn't really like all that much either. And so um, the third, fourth, fourth major that I had as an undergrad was uh, psychology, which I really enjoyed. And Mm -hmm. then combining that with some of the kinesiology interests that I had worked really well for me. And I I would say now, I think you could easily call yourself a teacher and a coach. You've landed there. That's true. I would agree with that. No, I would agree with that, actually. I mean, I think uh, even coaching students, whether it's office hours, whether it's master's thesis students, yeah, that 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 mentoring is coaching. Well, and I I work with athletes now right. as well, and right. so I work one on one. I work in some team settings, and so I agree. I've been in that sport environment. It's just something that I don't think I knew existed when I was growing up. The other thing is, right? You always hear me search, right? Of like I I study what I yes. want, and so I always in classes I give examples of. I was so stressed out in high school basketball. I remember we were playing in a game to go to state. And so I'm the youngest of five boys. All four of my older brothers had made it to state from our little tiny town, right? And so my senior year, we were playing to go to state. And I remember just freezing. I was... It was probably one of the worst games I've ever played. And I wish I had someone who would tell me, this is what's going to happen. This is how you could deal with it. This is how you could cope. This is how you could still function. Because I still think we would have made it if I had that. But, you know, sometimes that's not meant to be. So before I forget the thread, I've been carrying it in the back of my head. When you first defined kinesiology for me, and... I don't know if this is going to sound funny or not, but it's a legitimate question. It kind of sounds like a subset of psychology. Um, All of those things that you mentioned. It's interesting because one of the last sessions that you just had, one of the podcasts, I would say maybe a month ago, one of the professors was in a college that had both kinesiology and psychology, Yeah, David Kreiner. Right. And so when I was listening to that, I, I actually thought there are some some relationships that I definitely see exist, especially from my field of it with that sports site. Oh, yeah. Um, physiology, I think there are some definite parallels for sure. I mean, oh. anytime we say human functioning and we say without psychology, I think we're missing a huge piece of it, right? I mean, we teach a biological psychology course. Absolutely. We, I, I had a physiological psychology mm-hmm. course as an undergrad. Yep, yep. And biofeedback is something that a lot of sports psychologists use, and so I think there's huge overlap for it sure. Came out of psychology. Yep. Well, yeah. and I think a lot of what I do, too, as far as some of the positive youth development pieces that I do as well, overlaps with social work, overlaps with a lot of Child other development. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I mean, and I again, I'm not, I mean... I, I tease my colleagues over in sociology, you know, that sociology is just a subset of social psychology. You know, that drives them crazy. <laughs> uh, and it's it's obviously a lot more complicated than that. And they come back at me saying that social psychology is a subset of sociology, you know. <laughs> and I and actually there's data out there about psychology being the hub science and hmm. And so, um, but not that it... That's not biased research at all from, from your perspective actually it's, at all, it's it? Actually, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's done with a hub of science and social networks. And Interesting. It's actually really cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, not, not that it overly matters, but we're all interconnected. And, Absolutely. You know, yeah. So, um, so, so we, did you play... So you were the youngest of five. You played sports as a kid. Was I it did. all basketball? Um, I every grew up, sport? Basketball was my main sport. Um, I also golfed. So I, I went to a really small school, um, graduated with like 85 students. Where was that? If you in don't Colorado. Yep. Okay. So, oh, Colorado. Yep. Okay. So I was uh, kind of north of Denver by the Greeley, Loveland, Fort Collins area where we were really excited my junior year of high school. We combined with another town to make our high school and that other town got a mcdonald's big time big time my wife makes fun of my town i love millican so millican colorado give it a little shout out because i don't think anyone else on this podcast ever will right but she Not makes so fun far. of our uh, our little town because we uh it took us like eight months to put up our only stoplight in town and so she she said that usually takes a weekend eric in real towns and i said whoa 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 we're proud of that stoplight stop just stop you know there's there's nothing like little towns, man. I you agree. know everybody. Everybody takes care of everybody else. Yep. Um, there's, you know, that rural America is special and it's important. Yeah. And, you know, I've just been in conversations. Um, 
Boise State cares a lot about this. And yeah. and I know that our new president wants to really serve our, our rural students at, and, and pay special attention to them. I so, agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think even just not to get political because I don't want to, but I, that's one of the big pieces is people feel forgotten, right? Right. You know, and so if we can reach some of those people and show them, you know, there are things that we can offer them and not say it in a way that we know everything. I think that's one big piece is how we approach those, but we can offer things that can help them and move them forward or, you know, augment what they're already doing. Because I think if we go in and say, we know everything, then they're not going to listen to us. And why would they? But I think there are some things we can do to help them in whatever field or life or thing that they're doing at the time. Yeah, you know, in rural Idaho, uh, even in, in where we live, which is not so rural, but it's not as urban as like a San Francisco or a, or Chicago. Um, you know, we feel like we're flyover states because we are flyover states, and sometimes folks there get taken for granted. Definitely. So I want to ask you. Well, I want to ask you about teaching, and I want to ask you about research. So uh, dealer's choice, you pick them. Um, we'll do research. What do you got for me for research? I want to, no, I just want you to, so, uh, oh, the listeners don't know this. Uh, you are in the beginning of your fourth year. Is that correct? Correct. At Boise state. And, uh, it's two Eric's here sitting together and Eric is a very prolific researcher here at Boise state. He's been highly successful you are you applying for promotion tenure this year or next year? Um, I will indicate that I want to apply at the end of this school year, and then we'll go up next year. I think this podcast is the declaration that you are applying for promotion and tenure. We we can proclaim it from here. If, I'm okay with if that. If you want to have your department chair listen to the podcast <laughs> as the official declaration, he's applying. There you go. That's there, all we need. There, no no I, formal yeah. Thing I think that there's we need. no this paperwork. That's right. I think that's right. Um, but. But seriously, you, you, I see this coming. You see this from time to time. Um, the last podcast I recorded in this room was with April Mazurik, and you remind me of her. Incredibly productive, came out of a lab and out of a school that just knew how to train professionals to do the job in all the phases. So, so tell our listeners about how you, you can describe your research and that's fine. That's awesome. Whatever. How did you figure it out? Because not everybody figures it out the way you figured it out. And not everybody has your work ethic. And we've had plenty of lunches talking about this. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, first I want to say, again, I know the luck thing, but where I went, which part of that is selection, right? So I worked really hard as an undergrad. So yeah. I, I will I will definitely say that. But choosing where I went was so critically important to my success down the way. So I did my master's at Miami of Ohio. And so I would say, and obviously this is biased, but I think Miami is the best master's program in the nation. Just from a faculty perspective in sports psychology, they have five different faculty at a master's level and there's no PhD. So any opportunities that come through, you get those. And so I made a very um, clear decision that I wanted to try to get experience from everyone. So of those five, I worked one-on-one with all five of them at some point in those two years. So I got a, a really large range of mentoring, which I think helped in a lot of ways. One, it saw what the most successful people were doing. And then also it made me see some things that they were doing that I didn't want to do, not that they were wrong, but just that I didn't really want to do. Um, And they helped me kind of set myself up well for this next step, which was working at Michigan State, which was my PhD. And, And Dan Gould, if you know Sports Psych, he's probably one of the top one to three people in the field. I feel incredibly fortunate to work with him. And one thing Dan really, really emphasized. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm sorry, because I know you're on a roll. Before you move off from Miami and Ohio. please. How did you know to work with all five? Where did that gut instinct come from? Each one had something different that I wanted. So one thing that some people may say about me is I'm, I am 
not as singularly focused as maybe you would want someone to be or that you could be. And so each of them just offered a really different perspective. So Robin V. Lee was there and she offered really a consulting and research background that I really wanted to get experience with. Uh, Melissa Chase did a lot of coaching and consulting. So I knew I wanted some piece of that. Jay Kimichek did exercise psychology. So I wanted to get, you know, a little piece of that. Thelma Horn, who is one of the best people I've ever met, did youth sport, which is where I wanted to keep my focus on. And so I knew I wanted a piece of that. And then Robert Weinberg is there and he really does a lot of consulting at a high level. And I knew I wanted pieces of that. And so I just saw what everyone was doing. And I really took time that first year to say, you know, what are they doing and try to learn as fast as possible and then try to find out how I could be useful to them in their projects or in their consulting and try to just get experiences working with them. Okay, but other than a really impressive memory, congratulations. (laughs) How did you know to work with all five? Where did that come from? I think, like I said, just personal interest. I wanted a piece of each of what they could offer. And I knew... I think one thing okay. about me, and, and maybe if you say this, it's not true, but I feel like I'm pretty humble. And so I knew that I didn't know much going in there. And so if I could learn from all five of them, I thought that was just something huge. I mean, if we want to go way back when, I would say one thing that, especially my mom, but I would say my parents really instilled in me is like, you can always learn something from everyone. And so just the idea of learning from each of them who are at the top of their fields was just yeah. something that I wanted. I, 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 I agree completely, but I think it's really unusual. I can learn something from everyone. I completely agree. But I did learn something from everyone in two years. Is strikes me as phenomenal. I'm not surprised that you did that. But... But do you see the point I'm trying to make? That in two years, you found a way to work with five faculty members. I think, I, yes, I see that. I, part of that is that there were so many opportunities because it was a master's terminal. And so I think that was just such a unique thing that um, what Robin always said is, if you do good work, good work will find you, right? And so whenever I had an opportunity, I knew I needed to do that well. And when you do something well, you get recruited to do something else, and you get recruited to do something else. That, that, and so, that part is true. Okay. And, and so, I mean, part of that is is problematic after a while, right? That's one of the things I've talked to you most about is how do I say no to some of these great opportunities? Right, but you were in graduate school. True. So, so help me remember, help you, I, that, I'll say it. Remember back, if you can, to those master's degree days. And so you just said... There were so many opportunities. So I'm assuming those opportunities were available for everyone, which actually may not be true. Mm, To an extent. I would say they were available to all GAs. To all graduate assistants. So how many that you can recollect of those GAs worked with all five? What would be your estimate? You and how many others? You understand the point. For all five? I would say none. And there's my point, Eric. (laughs) Uh, Do you see my point? But again, I would say it's different where one person may have worked with one person, one faculty member extensively, where I tried to get that experience with all of them. You had the smorgasbord. Exactly. Which, I mean, if we talked about my research, you would see I have a smorgasbord of research as well, which Uh, can be good or can be problematic as well. So, And is it... Is it leading to success in your current employment? Definitely. I would say absolutely. That, then what's the problem? Well, and I think that's one of the nice things about um, ending up where I did is they give me kind of the freedom and the leeway to do what I want as long as I'm productive. And I feel like I take those opportunities to move forward. And I was also taught through my master's and PhD work to try to be as smart as you can with your productivity. So um, I work with uh, RISE, which is the Ross Ross Initiative in Sports for Equality. And so um, I worked with them because one of the people I went to grad school with is a director in the that 
organization. And so he needed somebody to do some reports on it. And so I, I did that and I did it well. And so he asked me to start doing some research. So I've been on some presentations, I've done different things. And so it's not something that I did probably at all in my master's or PhD, but it's something that I think is really valuable and it's something I enjoy and something that I can use as outreach working with Rise while also helping in getting some research publications and presentations out of it as well. You've got to be smart with that time. Now, I interrupted you when you were about to tell me about Michigan State. Michigan State was one of those that I um, really worked most extensively with one faculty member. So I took the smorgasbord approach in Miami, but um, really um, after my first two years, and I say that because I came in with another faculty member who retired and I knew she was going to retire. And so she helped me through the process, but really I worked most of my project work with Dan and Dan was just amazing. And I really appreciate his perspective in you know, we need to be doing research that's high quality, but that's impactful. And so how can we work with partners? How can we work with community groups and help them while still extending research and knowledge and moving forward, which is something I really value. And it fits well with my role here because I'm co-director of the Center for Physical Activity and Sport, which one of our main goals is really doing that community outreach, working with partners and moving forward that way. So uh, so tell me a little bit about that. The cent- co-director of the Center for Activity and physical Sport. Physical Activity I'm and sorry, Sport. I'm par- sorry. Yeah. yeah, I don't normally think about physical activity, <laughs> so you can pardon me for leaving oh. the word physical out. Well, um, so we have kind of a, a three-prong approach. It's doing high-quality research. And so as that co-director, I've done some research with the summer camps here, and then a lot of my research fits under there because we really focus on youth sport, which youth sport, is kind of all over the place. I, I kind of define it as anything below professional. Some people would say high school and below. I include college, especially early level college, because I feel like there's a lot of things we can learn about that level to mm-hmm. take to the youth sports. So doing high quality research. And then the second of that is really kind of trying to do that community outreach where we're making partners, we're helping them. And then the third is the dissemination of our research or trying to reach the public. And so of those three, I would say the third Third is probably the hardest, the one we're working the most on. I think part of that is finding the right partners to do that. So um, with Rise, I've helped them with some um, reports that have gone out to their stakeholders. And so me doing something, it's, you know, my mom will read it, maybe some other people. But they have, you know, on their board of directors are people like Roger Goodell, Gary Bettman, the commissioners of major leagues. And so they have such a larger footprint. And so working on those type of things, even if it's, you know, I'm a small byline, I help contribute to something like that, that reaches so many people that I think it's, it's pretty powerful. And so I think thinking of impact, and again, that goes into ego is, you know, if I don't get as much credit here, because I'm part of a team, but it actually reaches someone and it benefits some people, great, let's do that. And so I'm trying to do those type of projects Mm -hmm. in the Treasure Valley. um, We partnered with the athletic department to do a coaches clinic where we brought in people all over the state of Idaho. So we had about we had about 50 coaches come in for a one night process where we had coach rice and coach ball who used to be the softball coach and the men's basketball coach. They did presentations. I did a short presentation and really just kind of, kind of tried to make that connection, disseminate some high quality research while also bringing people in. And so those are the things that I really enjoy. Um, unfortunately, I think the nice thing about my role is it, that's valued, but for a lot of academics, that's not as valued or as least that's not as measured for tenure and promotion. And so it doesn't happen as okay. often. And so I really like my role because I still can do those type of things. And I, I feel like it's valued from my chair and some of the higher ups. Well, and I think those type of things in your department could not only be that va- viewed as scholarly activity, but it could also be viewed as service. Definitely. And, and there's, there's not only is there nothing wrong with uh, double dipping, uh, it's actually a good strategy. I agree. Yeah. So, so I want to I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about talk a little bit about what the transition was 
from Gre- – did you do a postdoc? I did. Well, sort of. So um, at Michigan State, I had a five-year fellowship where okay. the fifth year I didn't have to teach. And so I was there for a fifth year, so it was an informal postdoc. Okay. I was running projects. Um, that was the same time we had my son, Jameson. So I kind of had some duties there where I wasn't teaching, so my time was flexible. Okay. So more an informal postdoc, I would say, at Michigan State. I w- I was going to ask you about the transition from Michigan State to Boise State, or, or just more in general, that transition into a, becoming a new faculty member, um, work-life balance, making that transition. I, you know, I did it thirty years ago. It's been a long time for me. I'm an old man with a <laughs> long white beard. Kind of a nice white beard. Uh, thank though. you. It's the Santa Claus effect. <laughs> um. How did you deal with that? What were the challenges? And I l- let's just be clear. We've done this off the air. We can do it on the air. It's okay to be critical of your current employer. Sure. Um, I think where to start, right? <laughs> <laughs> One thing that was different about my transition than others is we had Jameson. So Jameson's my son. He's four now. So we had Jameson my last year at Michigan State. And so looking back even at what I was doing, um, so one of my research lines, so I'll go on a little tangent, right? As awesome. as some teachers do, right? Um, one of my my research lines is is passion. And so passion is kind of this internalized form of motivation where you can be motivated for everything is what I say, but you're only really passionate about maybe one or two things at a time. And so um, I study passion. And so one thing that I've always said that is absent in the research literature is this idea that you have to have this more negative form of passion, people call it obsessive passion, to be high achieving in some fields. So sport, I think, is a perfect example. There's this harmonious passion where if other things are taking happening or going on, you can kind of put away your sport, you can jump back into it and go forward. Where the obsessive passion is you feel like you're compelled to do it. And so I always think of like Olympians, right? Where I think they probably have to feel compelled to get up at four o'clock every morning Mm -hmm. and swim laps. And so I look back at my grad school days and I say, I was probably doing a pretty unhealthy way of doing it, but it got me here, right? And so it's one of those that at that time, I was willing to sacrifice some things that probably wasn't the best. I I look back and I say, man, there were weeks where I might've been putting in 75 hour weeks or 80 hour weeks and just projects needed to be done. I was working on a bunch of things because I knew I wanted to get a job. And so um, it actually was a difference in having Jameson that last year where I really had to say, that's no longer feasible, or at least that's not what I wanted to do. And so I really prioritized that time. And so it's kind of a two-edged sword, right? First, I can't put these time hours in anymore. And second, if I need to get this much work done, I need to actually be productive at all of my time. And so reevaluating some of my time, like I was in the office all the time, but there was a lot of Netflix that might've been going on or some (laughs) of those pieces. So I think that last year helped me be more productive in my time. And so when I transitioned as a faculty member, I knew that I wanted to have an eight to five thirty ish realm and then doing some stuff at home after, you know, Jameson went to bed. So like a nine till 10 30 realm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that was ideal. It didn't always happen. Sometimes I work later. I had to work later in the morning or some of those types of things, but I really wanted to prioritize getting stuff done. And so I feel like I see myself as being really productive. And that was one thing I really try to prioritize as a new faculty member coming in. The other thing that I think helped me significantly, and you're going to blush, is having a mentor who helped me put things in perspective, right? So the reason we met was because they matched us as mentors. So they must have just said, oh, two Eric's, they're fine. Just throw them together. Two rights can't make a wrong. Two Eric's, I I can't fill in the joke fast (laughs) enough. But just having a mentor outside of your department, I think, is so critically important because there were times where I'd, I'd talk to you, and I remember going is this normal in my department? This is what's going on. Is this normal? Because I've never experienced anything like this. It, it wasn't. <laughs> and it wasn't. So that that's nice to have that validation that it's, okay, something 
is a miss or something is not what it should be here, right? And so one, either work to change that or two, just not try to restructure so that doesn't impact me directly, yeah. I think was really important. And so I think that was the biggest thing is learning new dynamics, new politics, what the new normal is. I love the people that I work with, but um, they take work-life balance very seriously. And that can be very beneficial, but I also see that I want to publish a lot more than some of them want to or value or want to put the time in. And so finding the colleagues within that unit that had that same attitude, I think was really important for me. Um, the other thing, and, and one thing that I always laugh at because I, I told you some of these things and you're like, yeah, that, that sounds like I would be more in that way. But as a new faculty member, like I remember going to grad school and I was really lucky because at my master's program, I loved so many of those students that I went with. Like I still am best friends with a few of them. I call them all the time. At my PhD, it was just as good. There were couples that worked well. So Kristen was involved. We just, we really hit it off. And then I came here and I am significantly younger. So I would say there are people at the same stage of careers, but they had postdocs or they were more professionals. And so I was the youngest person in my department and I, I really wanted to make those connections. And so I tried doing happy hours and I tried doing, you know, a barbecue and a few people showed up, but I was disappointed that the whole department didn't show up because in grad school, everybody showed up to tailgates. We just all tailgate. We have fun. Yeah. We may not go to the game, but you know, we're all tailgating. We're having a good time together. And so I think just talking to you and, and I think both you talking to me and then just reevaluating of appreciate the people who are coming instead of appreciating or being upset the people who aren't, um, I think really helped as far as this isn't going to be your best friends. They're going to be colleagues that you can work with. They're going to be people that you probably like quite a bit, but they're not going to be your best friends. They're just not at the same stage of life as you are. They're not, they don't have the same, um, priorities as you have at this moment. And so just understanding that it's going to be different was a big adjustment for me. Yeah. I th it's different for everybody at different stages and sometimes different places. I mean, I know people around the country in the, in their departments of psychology, they do have those relationships like you had in grad school at master's and PhD where, where everybody, they, their families do get together and they're tight knit. Um, so there are departments like that, um, but it's not universal. And sure. I, I really do think it's a lot about stages of life and who's got little ones Absolutely. and who's got them grown and gone and, and different people find the time to prioritize recreation. Well, and I think even so... Which is a good thing, I think. Absolutely. Well, and even my perspective has changed from my first year here to my fourth year here, right? Where before I had one kid, he was super mobile. Now we have two. And so even my perspective on some of that has changed. And so it, it is definitely like... What stage are you at? Where's everyone else at? And to expect that everyone would be at the same stage at this point where there have been people who have been at Boise State, I think someone just retired who had been here like 30 years, to expect them to be similar or at the same stage as someone who was here for the first year, I think is unrealistic. And it's just something that I never thought about because every step I had, that group was at that same stage as I was. I don't think it's unrealistic, I, but I could, I could see, let, let's flip it. I could see you going to the effort of wanting some cohesion and some bonding and and your new faculty member and no one's organizing anything. So I'm going to organize something. Let's get together. Um you you want some you want some kudos for that. And, and the best way to do it is to show up. And so I mean faculty members can make an effort to support their colleagues. I mean uh but I, I so I think that's too strong. I wouldn't, I, I, the way that's phrased, it sounds like that's more problematic for them. I, I understand what you're saying, but I wouldn't put that on them necessarily. I would say it was, like I said, unrealistic expectations that everybody would want to do that type of thing or would even have the capabilities of doing that. Well, type but of maybe thing. not everybody, but I mean, or, or they could have said, oh man, let's not do a cookout, but let's meet downtown at Bardenay or something like that. I mean, and, and I think one thing I learned through that, though, is there are people who will do that. And so 
connect with those people right. because I do have really good colleagues or friends that I feel like from yeah. the Kines department, but it took me a little bit to adjust that I'm not going to be great friends with everyone. And so which people are at that same point that do value those type of things as well at that time. Yeah. And, th- and this could be a very dangerous topic, but I think, I think this is the fun of the podcast. I mean, I think you really gauge how well you know your colleagues. Yeah, okay, we may have to edit this part out. <laughs> and 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 you're you're not going to I'm stepping in it now. I mean, I think you know, I think one gauge of how well you know your colleagues is um how do you know their significant other's name? Which is ironic because that's something that Kristen has said. She still has not met multiple people in my department. And I'm I, I, yeah. and, and and if I went down the hall and, and went person to person, would I could I name you their significant other? And if they have children, could I name you all their children's yeah. names? And I'm starting my 28th year at Boise State, and I am now the most senior person in the department. So I have been here the longest. <laughs> so, but. You know, so, th- and so some people I could do that, and some people I can't. Sure. And so that's an indicator of familiarity. It's probably a rough index of friendship, I guess. Yeah, of course it would have to be, right? You, or at least connection. I would. I don't know if it's even friendship, but a connection. Connection I would say. for sure. Yeah, and yeah. so. It is what it is. And again, that goes yeah. back to those values of do. Are there people in the department who want? work life and personal life to be separate, right? And so yeah. that's that's something that was never something that I had. Like I said, I mean, when you go to school, I went straight through, and so I never took time off. And so it was, oh, it's a bunch of 22-year-olds who are all at the same point. And then going to grad school, oh, it's a bunch of 24-year-olds who are all at the same point, right? And so we were all there, and we were, you know, some of us were away from home for the first time, and so this was our family. I mean, at grad school, for Thanksgiving, we would have like 30 people over because we were the only people who had a house big enough. And so I was like, the more the merrier, let's do this. You know, I, I love having those connections. And so we would just have these huge things. And so I, like I said, I think it's just unrealistic expectations yeah. for what I had coming in. And, okay. and I found a niche now that I think works really well for me, but it was adjusting what I would think of as success or what I would think of as connection. And and we'll move off of this in just a second. But, you know, as I think about it, you know, I, I have, I have friends that I dearly adore that are on this floor, but my best friends in psychology are throughout scattered throughout the country. So Regan and Martha with his kids, uh, Liam and Melina are in Corvallis and uh, Anna lives in uh, Denver, and Jane and Brian live in Florida, and Garth and Danielle, with their daughter Angelique, live in Seattle. And please, friends, don't be don't be left out, <laughs> uh, because I only listed four people <laughs> and their families. And so I I don't know if that's a function of age. I think it's probably more a function of me. But I would say too, at the same time, I have those relationships as well. And I think that's just kind of where you connect with. So like I would say people from my master's or PhD are spread out all over. And it's just a little, I wouldn't say different, but like for Kristen, she doesn't see those people, right? So I see them at conferences is when I see them. And so for her, it's a lot harder because I still feel like I have those really strong relationships, even though I see them maybe once a year, maybe once every couple years. But unless she comes to a conference with me, she's not seeing them for five, six, seven years. And so I think that was the other kind of impetus is she doesn't have those connections. And so trying to establish something in Boise that would be able where we could both go through that. Now we've made connections in other places. So we've met people through Jameson's daycare and through different things like that, right? Where we have outstanding friends in Boise now. And Mm -hmm. so we're really lucky to have that, but, um, it was just a shift of your best friends don't have to be at Boise state. You know, you, you need to work with people. You need to have similar values and want to be around them for, 
40 hours a week, right? Or maybe less so 40 for minutes some. a week. <laughs> but but they don't have to be right. your support group. And we, we found that other places. And like I said, that was just a change of, you know, we were thinking that it was just going to be normal. We'd come in with other people who were the same stage of life, the same way. And I even say that where in our department, that wasn't the case, but two of our best friends are two professors in communications who were coming in at the same time. I collaborate with them. I work with them. We see them on weekends. We go to Shakespeare festival with them. And so again, it's, it's just finding those connections, and I really wanted yeah. it to be within the department, and it's not, and that's okay, because I found it somewhere else. That's awesome. So I want to ask you the classic question that we tend to ask very often. Growing up, was it uh, if you were going to go to college or which college you would go to? It was definitely which college were you going to. So okay. um, I'm the youngest of five. I always joke that I'm the dumb one of the five, right? So my oldest brother is a mechanical engineer, and he makes more than the other four of us combined, right? Okay. My brother, Ryan, is uh, he works for the government, and he has a master's degree. Uh, my brother, Chad's a DVM, so he's a vet. And then my brother, Adam, has two master's degrees. And so we always grew up— How could you be the dumbest of five? Because I didn't have the PhD until a few years ago, see? Okay. So it was it was a close call up but, until I moved up there. But with all due respect to number two— See, I feel like I worked the hardest. See, may not be the most intelligent, but I worked the hardest. Well, maybe not even that's true, but still. Okay. Can, can we revise that now? Or is this the baby of the family kind of— so it's it's funny because uh, a few of your your guests have talked about you know parents just not really understanding and and I've had I have great parents like my mom especially is just unbelievable but I remember going home throughout my doctoral degree and my dad would go so you have a job yet <laughs> and I'm like no it it doesn't really work like that you know I'm in this program four years maybe five years we'll see and then and then I'll get a job okay. Still no job. Okay, sounds good. So, so, so it's just an expectation, you know, of of, of just some of that stuff. And so it, it's funny because um, I, my dad has a degree from Colorado State, and I always thought growing up, my mom did because she was always the one who helped with education. She made sure our homework was done. Just always went to parent teacher conferences. She was like a superwoman and all, right? And so it wasn't until. I want to say maybe even I was in college that I found out that she had an associate's and not a full bachelor's. Mm -hmm. And so it's just one of those that like I never would have even thought that because she valued education and was so um, – so adamant that this is what we were going to do. I mean, when I was in... She was adamant. Adamant. When I was in high school, and, and it wasn't like she pushed me to do it, right? So she was just unbelievably supportive. And, and so we didn't make the most amount of money, right? And so she, junior, senior year, she would say, I filled out all this scholarship stuff. All you have to do is write the essay, right? So I filled out this stuff. This is what this is for. This is what it is. Let's write this together, you know? And so she set a path that was amazingly supportive and helpful to the extreme. So a couple of questions came to mind. So was or is your dad a sports fanatic? Is he a sports guy? It's interesting because he is a sports guy. And so most of my sport-related memories are with him. So he used to take me to Bronco games when I was little. Um, Denver Broncos. Denver Broncos. Yep, not Boise State. So um, I used to be a Chiefs fan, Kansas City Chiefs fan, though. And so I would wear my you know, Chiefs coat at the Broncos stadium where – you would be amazed at what grown men would do to a six or seven year old kid wearing an alternative jersey or Yikes. An alternative jacket. Let's just say batteries and beers were not off limits. So, wow, yeah, batteries. Fa fandom is an interesting subject. For That's sure. harsh. Um, so he did that, and then he um, coached some youth sports stuff when we were growing up. I was played on 4 H softball, 4 H basketball, that kind of stuff. And so he was super involved in all of that stuff, but. Um, as far as academics, he was supportive, but really it was my mom who who really pushed all of us and helped us with anything that we needed. So with the sports dad, does he get a kick out of the blue turf where his son works? 
he he's come to a couple games. He's come. Uh, he wore his Colorado State stuff when he came to the Boise State, which we took Jameson to. I think that might have been one of his first games, and Jameson loved it because there were a lot of fireworks because they score a touchdown and they shoot fireworks. That's right. And so Boise State, I think, had 42 points in the first half. So Shot the cannon. That's right. And so he was loving the first half, and the second half started, and they hadn't scored for a while, and he, he's like, where, where are the fireworks? And I said, well, they have to score – and so he's like, we should we should go if there's not more fireworks, so, <laughs> which we did because it was it was not a, a fun game to be at for for that. Fans Colorado are State. very finicky. That's we're, true. We're, That's true. We're very spoiled since 2007. That's we're, true. We are very spoiled. <laughs> I was gonna, what was I gonna ask you? So that the five brothers, what's the age gaps from oldest to youngest? It's big. So my oldest brother is 15 years older than me. So okay. I'm actually closer in age to my oldest nephew than I am to my oldest brother. And so we sometimes joke that it's almost like we have three families. So my oldest brothers are 15 and 13 years apart uh, or apart from me. Mm-hmm. And then my brother who's right in the middle is just kind of isolated. He's alone. So he is nine years older than me. And then my brother, Adam, who's the closest to me, he's only, he's three years older than I am. So it's almost like two, one, two. Big gap. Yes, very much Big so. Gap. Okay. All right. You didn't get picked on too badly. The two see, of you, the see, two little is, ones. Got you me. always joke that I can see things and I, I kind of, I, I'm knowledgeable of that stuff. So I knew I was the youngest. So I partnered with the middle to pick on the second youngest. So I was always the one who is not being picked on. I feel bad for Adam most of the time. But see, the big I, it's smile on your face. It's okay. self survival. For the, for you the wonder listeners, where that strategic thinking came in. For the family <laughs> listeners, I want to point out the big ass <laughs> smile on his face <laughs> about how bad he feels. Adam and I are great now. At the time, now. maybe not so much, but well, this is it's self survival, right? This is so. the beneficial effect of therapy. <laughs> Good. You're you're good now. You're oh. good now. And so, uh, Eric, what do you enjoy teaching? I am. So it's interesting when I when I went to Michigan State, I taught um, a variety of classes, including research methods and some of those. Um, I never taught an exercise psychology course until I got here, but I actually enjoy teaching that one the most out of all my classes because really? I feel like it's just so applicable. I have some um, assignments that students initially kind of grumble about, but I think at the end of the semester, they really have enjoyed and it, they see the application from it. And so I feel like, I don't know if that's because I had to kind of start that one from scratch instead of having a template or what, but I really have felt like that's the class that I enjoy teaching most. And you have graduate students as well, right? I do. I teach um, both the sports psychology theory class and the sports psychology applied class. And then I also teach in the Masters of Athletic Leadership program. So I teach a psychology of leadership course. The exercise psychology almost sounds like it ought to be in the Department of Psychological Science. I, I think there are parallels. Well, you you have a health psychology over here. We do. Psych so 331. That's right. So hopefully they don't overlap too much. I, I doubt it. I, I I doubt it. It's it's almost like one could substitute for another, but that's a t- <laughs> that's a topic for another day and a very 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 inside joke. That that's probably not very nice. Um, I know I've kept you uh, almost an hour. Um, what what big plans do you have? Do you have some a uh, big study that you're about to unroll? Uh, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to tell listeners? What do you want to tell the folks back home? One of the newest lines of research, which, like I said, I have a smorgasbord of research, right? So one of the newest lines of research that I've, I've started doing is with uh, my colleague in communications that I actually was talking about, where we're really looking at resilience in Boise State students. And so we're doing um, kind of a dual threat kind of topic where we're looking at quantitatively kind of what do Boise State students kind of look like as far as social support, resilience, coping strategies, some of those aspects that go with it, how stressed they are, what's their distress levels, looking at that to just kind of get a a marker of where are Boise State students at, and then a qualitative portion where we're interviewing key stakeholders at Boise State University where we're saying, you know, what do you do to really impact student resilience? What kind of programming you do? What are the needs? And so with some of this stuff that we've gone through, we've actually started talking about um, trying to create some type of um, pivot class. So again, having colleagues that are knowledgeable about this stuff is really nice. So the other communications instructor, professor over there, really is big on um, 
kind of what can we do moving forward? And so talking about creating some type of pivot class where it's in the middle of, you know, maybe between sophomore and junior year, we use that as really a time to reflect on what's happened in the last two years Mm -hmm. and then pivot that forward of what are our goals? How have they changed? What are we trying to do to hopefully impact them working through some of those student success markers that we all hear about. It's a, is it targeted for student athletes? Um, that one is not. That's more of a general one. I'm okay. also doing in the same line, um, working with freshman student athletes. We just got a grant through the NCAA where we're working with ourselves and then Illinois State, another colleague that I have over there, sure. where we created some type of um, transition programming. So it's a four module system. The first module is looking at developing a more well rounded identity. Second, Second one is really talking about social support and where you can find that on campus or kind of in your own life. The third is really talking about coping and how you can cope or what things to cope with and what's the most positive ways of doing that. And then the fourth one is really looking at an external view of how can you develop as a leader over these next four years. And so that one's really targeted at, you know, those freshman student athletes coming through. And so we're running it in person at Boise State. Um, Bronco Life has been super supportive of letting us come into a program they already had and integrate this curriculum. Mm -hmm. And then Illinois State's running it um, via online. And so we have those two groups we're going to compare as far as effectiveness. And then we're also, we have a control group at Boise State as well. You understand why I'm smiling, right? I don't. (laughs) That's all psychology. Oh, yeah. That's, that's sports no, psychology. No, that's, what that's I mean. no kinesiology at all. Uh, it doesn't belong in a department of kinesiology. That's the, where I'm located. It belongs there. in a that's, department that's of who psychological was hiring science. when I came out. So. You did, okay, let's go there then. <laughs> you, you started this. I got, I got plenty of uh, silicon in that uh, memory chip. Uh, did you look at departments of psychology when you were um, on the job market? No, because typically when they are recruiting someone or then they're hiring people, they are hiring someone with a clinical background who also has sports psychology. Oh, the, when they're looking for a sports psychologist, they want the clinical side. Exactly. And not the performance enhancement side. Exactly. And so um, my role as a, as a professor, as a researcher, I think would be pretty consistent either way. I think that clinical is where athletic departments really want someone to be because student athletes are just like regular students, right? They, they have needs right. that are mental health. And so if they can hire someone who does mental health and helps athletes that way, and they can also do some consulting, great. For me, it's more of an extra cost. And so athletic departments don't really look at me all that much, but, um, as far as psychology departments, it's just harder to get into those. So if you, if you had to describe yourself and you could not use the label sports psychologist. Well, it's interesting because technically I cannot use the label sports psychologist. And so um, I say I'm a professor of sports psychology, right? Mm -hmm. And then my role where I am actually certified is I'm a certified mental performance coach. And that's through the Association for Applied Sports Psychology. That's the label they have come up with. And so I am a CMPC, which means um, I think they're only... Last I knew, there were like 700 of the prior certification worldwide. Um, I would guess there's probably 200 to 250 worldwide who have that certification currently. Oh, I'm sorry. Will you say that the, what the it's acronym stands for again? Certified Mental Performance Consultant. Certified Mental Performance. Because we can't use legally, because so many of us have kinesiology backgrounds, the sports psychology name. But but they let you get away with the mental. Mental is not a legally certif- protected term by APA, correct? Which APA this is, fell asleep. If, with the switch if, if on I that can one. rant slightly, right? Please. So so I I am fine. I I don't need to use the word sports psychologist. I have other ways of describing myself. That's no problem. But the reason I can't, or the rationale for not using it, is because of qualifications for it, which I understand completely. But there are people who are psychologists who say, oh, I think I could make some money doing sports, so I'm going to call myself sport psychologist. And so I would say they are more unqualified to use that term than I am, and yet that is never part of the discussion. And so that's frustrating from my side, mm-hmm. um, largely because I'm on this side, right? Right, but, of course. But I think that is disappointing that some people would say, oh, if he's calling himself a sports psychologist, that's completely unethical, which I would agree. But then someone who is a colleague who has no sport background, who does not understand human movement at all, 
is using that term and they don't bat an eye, which yeah. is frustrating. Well, and I, I can't call myself a psychologist. Right. I'm right. not licensed in the state of right. Idaho. Right. Exactly. And the term psychologist in the state of Idaho is a legally protected term. I knew that. Yeah. Oh, and I knew you yeah, knew that, yeah, but yeah. now our listeners there do too. There we go. Too. Everybody does now. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, I might loosely sometimes in an audience, if I'm talking to students, I might call myself a psychologist, but if I'm asked about it technically, of course I'll fess up. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, I, there, like I said, I, I am a professor of sports psychology. My, my PhD is in sports psychology. Right. That is what it is. And so, um, I'm comfortable saying that I don't need the term sports psychologist. Yeah. Lots of people who I work with call me a sports psychologist or introduce me as a sports psychologist. Yeah. And that is fine. Too. And this isn't where I thought we were going. Well, here's <laughs> where I thought we were going. If a department of psychology was going to hire you, under what label would it be? Would it be a health psychologist? Would that be the closest label? Would it be a... Uh, in education, I believe I can still be hired under a sports psychologist or sports psychology designation. Yeah. Um, and so I would say I would be sports psychology. Yeah, but if, if departments of psychological science, if you were looking at the back of that... APA monitor or uh, the APS observer, if you were looking at job ads, you know, and if they weren't using the label sports psychologist and you were looking at your qualifications and what you can teach, I'm thinking you'd probably line up pretty well with health psychologist. I would say that's fair. Exercise that's, psychology, health psychology, yeah. um, some of those, yeah. Yeah, I don't think you'd see something as specific as exercise psychology. I think that would be pretty rare Although I haven't looked at the ads, we write them all the time because people are retiring. So that's what we're doing. Fair. So we'll we'll be writing one. There you go. So you never know. Well, Eric, it's actually been just about at the hour. Any last thoughts that you want to share? I'm, I'll try to give you the last word before I thank you. I am glad I am on this. I, I know I've been mentioned multiple times you by have. you. And so I, I, every time I get that, I shoot you a nice text message and I say, hey, another time. Well, when, when am I going to be on the podcast? And, 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 now, and so enough badgering has finally happened. It's, it's not that... been badgering. And <laughs> let me let me just say, you said something nice earlier. Let me say something nice back. Um, mentoring is a two-way street. And... It may be that new faculty need or have the desire to be mentored. Um, I can tell you that at every part of your career, you need mentoring. And so um, I I am confident that I've gotten just as much or more out of our mentoring relationship as you have, which is why I wanted to continue it after the formal year. So, Well, I thank appreciate you. it. I, I have enjoyed our relationship and I consider you a mentor and a friend, which is very right back very nice. at you. So I cannot, you know, apologize for your poor choices. But outside of that, I really appreciate everything. Eric, thanks for being on Psych Sessions. Mm-hmm.